All right. Um, I think we should get started because we have quite a few presentations today and we hope to also have some time for questions and answers. Can everybody hear me okay? Great, good. Um, well, welcome to the core webinar um, on uh, from open access to open science, transitioning to research data services. My name is Kathleen Shearer, and I'm the executive director of CORE, the Confederation of Open Access Repositories. And um, as I was saying to the panelists earlier, I'd like to thank them all for contributing to this webinar, um, helping our members move and adopt and expand services to research data. Managing research data is an important priority for CORE. I think um, it's, uh, we, re, uh, institutions and research libraries need to position themselves as having an important role in the area of research data management. And therefore, CORE would like to help our members and the repository community in general take on greater responsibility for this. Um, and I think one of the best ways to start is have, by having our members share their experiences and stories together. Um, with others. So with no further uh, ado, I'd like to introduce our first panelist, um, the very famous Robin Wright <laughs> um, from uh, the University of Edinburgh. And they've been involved for quite a significant amount of time in um, uh, research data management services at their institution. And so with that, I'd like to hand the microphone over to Robin. Okay, thank you, Kathleen. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, good. Now, let's see if I'm sharing my screen, yes? Not yet. Oh. Rats. Let's see, oh, I see. So it's, I have to press the next button. Looks Is that good. better? Yep. Okay. Okay. Thank you everyone for coming. Um, so I've given my part of the talk a very fancy title of um, applying gap analysis to a data lifecycle approach in development of RDM services. And that sounds very academic, but it's actually quite simple. Um, which will become apparent as I go. And well, that's interesting. The space bar doesn't work. Okay, there. Sorry. Uh, so, so this is just a, a quick slide about the University of Edinburgh to, um, to let you know that we're a very big university, a very old university. Uh, a research intensive university and so fortunately for those of us working in data support um, they find it worth their while to invest in in data support as you can see the mission of the university is the creation dissemination and curation of knowledge so the fact that the word curation is in there we um, we keep reminding them for all it's worth uh, so that they keep funding us and we have um, lots and lots of disciplines covered, pretty much everything I can think of, except, unfortunately, library science. And also, just to, to give you context about, you know, we're able to do this from a very large university. We also have a very large um, support system. Uh, information services is both library computing, but also some of these other things we have a whole department on user support and um, and some specialist uh, divisions such as Adina and the Digital Curation Center, which obviously gives us access to expertise in-house, which also um, puts us in a fortunate position. Um, so as Kathleen said, um, we've been doing this for a while, so I always feel the need to say a little bit of history about it. Um, we've been doing research data management as a service kind of for a long time, but also kind of for a short time. Um, I was involved with the data library 
which is a data service, but it wasn't focused on RDM. It was uh, focused on helping people find and use data sources. Um, so there were some pre-existing projects and services across information services around the time of 2010. The DCC was already in existence. Um, we even had, uh, the term RDM did exist then, uh, was around and JISC was funding us for a couple of projects such as DataShare and Mantra at that time. So, um, so we had some building blocks before we even really started focusing on RDM um, as a service. Uh, some of us involved in those kinds of activities then formed what we called an action group. And I think that's probably useful for yourselves if you're just getting started. Look around for champions, um, people who are interested, and just start having meetings to see what you might be able to pull together with the resources that you do have available to you. Um, that activity fortunately kind of led to things and we had access to senior management who helped us um, get an RDM policy in place in 2011. Um, and then following on from that, we created our first research data management roadmap, um, setting out how we, would in, how we would make the policy come to life, so to speak. Um, kind of set out the, the roles of, uh, of the researcher in doing uh, quality research with integrity and, and including data management and also the job of the university to provide support and facilitate best practice. Um, also around that time, we developed a, kind of put in place a governance committee, a group of academics and service providers um, to kind of steer the service development and make sure we were developing things fit for purpose. And that was very um, helpful actually, because it, it meant there was buy-in uh, within the academic community and another way of getting the word out about the new services. Um, I think my formal service designation date got cut off. Um, I think I put that in as 2015. It coincided with our new uh, CIO and librarian to the university coming in, uh, Gavin McLaughlin, who decided that research data should be a service in itself. So instead of this kind of cobbled together program that we had been doing, it became a service owner following a service framework, service owner, service operations manager, and a designated business owner who was the chair of our steering group. Uh, we started using the data lifecycle as a service metaphor um, in at least uh, 2016, which I'll, I'll go into. And now we're doing our third roadmap. So we always thought of the roadmap as a living document, always improving, always um, eyes on the prize of the next things that we need to achieve. So that's kind of hopefully the context of the service itself. And I'm the service owner um, dealing with providers across that information services group that I showed you. So here is a data life cycle. You've probably seen these before. Um, everybody has their favorite diagram. This is my diagram of the day uh, from data one, a very good project in the US, um, kind of focused on environmental and geosciences, but very relevant. Um, to at least all the sciences. So they, they indicate this life cycle for the researchers' actions, plan, collect. Um, so whether that's collecting in on, like doing interviews and as a human-to-human uh, -human kind of collecting data or whether it's using machines or sensors. Um, assure is one of the things I like about this life cycle. It doesn't always come in there, but doing quality assurance on your data verification, making sure that things are correct and that there aren't strange outliers that don't make any sense. Um, you have to describe your data one way or another. I, we usually call that documentation. So when people say documentation is metadata, I tend to differ a bit because I think documentation is something humans read to make sense of the data. Um, preserve. We know basically we want the researcher to use a trusted repository, not try and do it themselves. Uh, and then, of course, you're on the discover side, finding new data, integrating it, and analyzing it. So that's why it's a life cycle. If you've not seen these before, the data goes around and around, um, always having a new use, at least potentially. It also kind of represents the researcher's actions on the data. So we adopted this simplified life cycle 
to describe our services because um, the diagram can get a bit tricky, certainly at a glance. Uh, you you kind of have to, it's good for training to tell um, tell people in depth about the different actions, but we wanted, we wanted a metaphor where we, people could just understand at a glance. So we have before your research project begins, during your research project, and after. So the things you need to do about planning, working with data, and um, sharing and archiving. And then we have a whole bunch of training and support that doesn't fit in that cycle. It could be at any point in the cycle. So we try to carry that metaphor over to our website, as you can see before you begin while your work is in progress at the end of your research. Now there's, that's because we have a lot of components to this service, um, kind of services within a service you might say, and we need to slot them in in a, in a way that makes sense. So now I'm gonna tell you about the services uh, quickly because I'm running out of time. Um, so we have, we use DMP online. We also provide face-to-face -face support, or uh, I don't know why I said face-to-face. -face. It's often not face-to-face -face over email or phone, face-to-face -face meetings if need be. We do support people with uh, reviewing their DMPs, especially those who are trying to get uh, funded projects in with a DMP, and we keep a sample of DMPs. So kind of a range of things we can do to help people on that side of things. Then there's during, which is a number of things, the, the most important of which is the active data store, active data storage. And we call it active because it's different from archival storage. And we try and get that across because it's using different systems. Um, so that's central backed up storage for all researchers. They, they get a free allocation of half a terabyte. Uh, they can create shared spaces with some of their allocation and they can purchase more space and hopefully um, it's at a cost that is attractive to them and their funders. Um, the finding data is the this kind of data library function as it's evolved. Data Safe Haven is something we're um, working on to launch soon to provide um, active data storage for sensitive data and other things like GitLab for code versioning, Data Sync, which is kind of our version, um, open source solution, similar to Dropbox, we like to say, although the researchers don't think it's as good as Dropbox. Um, and electronic lab notebooks, we're just entering a contract with our space and also being open to others to help people manage their data during their research. And afterwards we have um, Data Share, which is one of those ones that's been around from the beginning and it seems to have benefited from having a, a long time to slowly build up that curve and we do get a lot of data sets and we do quality assure them as they come in and um, we're able to have staff that can do that. Um, so that allows the researchers to share data publicly and preserve for the long term up to 100 gigabytes is uh, per deposit we take and that's all free. Uh, data Vault is a charge service that's just coming on board which is kind of the opposite, it's closed, it's, um, it's long-term retention to comply with research funders' uh, requirements. What happens after that period, it might be 10 years, it might be some other period, um, we're trying to put in policies in place so that it becomes a un university data asset, the university can decide what will happen to it at, at the end if the researcher is no longer there. And I'm aware I'm running out of my time, so, um, Let's see, the, yeah, so the last one is our university, Chris, um, uh, is what we use for like, what we identified as a data asset register. I forgot to say that uh, with that life cycle, we've been slowly building on these services since 2012, um, filling in the gaps. So in some cases, right from the time of the policy, we knew there were gaps in services and we, maybe we put in funding to try and get development money to build it up, such as the Data Vault and the Data Safe Haven. Um, in other cases, we've, we've been able to convince the university they should fund the activity on an ongoing basis. So, um, so the last one should help people with open science um, and FAIR principles as well, because uh, it would be open record no matter where their data is shared. 
um, and that, and also if they put a closed record in the vault, there will be an open record in the CRIS. Um, by default, they can get a DOI, but on, on the other side, people will be able to discover that data and ask them for it. So we've kind of got things covered once we get those two last services in place, but there's always more to do. Um, I guess there is probably, yeah, there's another one. I need, I need to stop so others have a turn. I'll just leave this slide up while I finish my sentences about, so we, we, we do training and support in a number of ways, including some online training, um, going out and trying to get engagement, get invited to come to staff meetings, uh, put on regularly scheduled training in a, through our university portal that the research students can discover. And we have an annual dealing with data event where we get the researchers together to talk about their issues. And we have a blog, so, which you're welcome to um, subscribe to. But I will stop there so that somebody else can go. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Robin. Um, so I think what we're going to do is leave the questions till the end after all of the presentations. And um, because we have uh, six presentations today, we'll likely, the webinar will probably go till about 1030, just so everybody knows. Um, and um, thanks, Robin. And our next presenter is Sven, and I'm, I'm probably going to butcher your last name, Sven. <laughs> Fleming? <laughs> ah, that's correct. <laughs> oh, great, great. From the Leibniz Information Center of Economics. Um, and he's going to talk about their RDM services. So I hand the microphone over to you. Thanks. Yes, uh, thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction, Kathleen. So I hope now you can see my screen. That's correct. Ah, perfect. Okay. So uh, I would like to talk about uh, our approach and the experiences uh, we made with starting RDM services for economists. So uh, we have a few more services now, but in this talk, I only want to focus on this uh, particular project. So um, our first project on RDM was uh, European uh, Data Watch Extended or EDAWAX. And the intention of EDAWAX was to develop a data repository for journals in economics. So, yes. But um, before I go into the details of the project, uh, I'd like to say a few words uh, regarding ZBW. I think uh, some of you already might know ZBW as uh, this year's annual meeting of COA took place uh, in Hamburg. So in our branch at Hamburg, that's uh, where I'm based. Um, but for those who don't know, ZBW is the world's largest specialist library on economics. And uh, we're not uh, part of an university and we don't have a campus or things like that. Uh, that means that we are not focusing on local services, but on supra-regional and international services for the economic research community. And uh, probably uh, some of you uh, know our disciplinary publication repository, EconStore, which is a large rep uh, open access repository. And uh, yes, okay, so, um, yes, and then uh, the project uh, IDAVAX, so um, um, the, the, uh, the project IDAVAX uh, received uh, two uh, funding phases uh, from uh, the German Research Foundation um, and uh, the project has been initiated by the editors, by two editors of uh, economics journals, who asked our department for assistance uh, for their journals because they said, well, uh, we have a lot of articles, uh, empirically articles, research articles, and uh, we want to have a place uh, for our research data. Can you help us? Therefore, the mission was uh, to develop a useful service for storing replication data uh, of these uh, empirical articles. And the project phase uh, consisted of, uh, so or the project consisted of uh, three phases. So first there's been an analysis phase, uh, and then there's been the conception phase and then implementation and evaluation phase. And uh, I wanna shortly go through these phases as they um, are um, particular, quite important for our approach. So, uh, 
In particular, the analysis phase was very fertile for us because we received many information on economic uh, research methodology, on uh, the data we, uh, uh, and many other aspects of research data management. We started with an evaluation of journals' data policies and uh, by doing so, we also learned a lot about the research methodology in economics, the data and potential data sources, but also on the software packages in use, uh, what is of course uh, important uh, when you want to create or to develop a data archive, a data repository. Uh, in another work package, we also analyzed the perceptions uh, and of economists towards data sharing. We developed a theoretical framework on the one hand, so a model, and uh, on the other hand, we also conducted an empirical study of uh, approximately 500 people, so top researchers uh, in the world, and checked uh, what, uh, what they did when it comes to data sharing and how many of them uh, really shared their data. So not only, uh, so what do you think about data sharing, is it useful or not, but really to look, all right, what did these people, did they share their data? And uh, well, this was uh, quite interesting and uh, we still have a lot of work to do, I can tell you. Um, yeah, okay. In addition, uh, we also scanned uh, whether there are existing services for economics journals and uh, assembled some legal information for the various types of data with regard to data sharing. Because there are, of course, almost uh, every time there are questions from researchers, mm, am I allowed to share this data? Mm, is it okay or not? And therefore, we uh, wanted to collect uh, some information for them, at least for the most typical uh, parts of data. Okay, and then, uh, yes. Um, in a second step, uh, we developed the requirement specifications for the data archive. Uh, the findings of uh, most of the work package, packages have been incorporated in uh, this uh, specification sheet. I do not uh, want to go through uh, the single uh, work packages. If you have any questions regarding special parts of it, just let me know or please get in touch. So no problem at all. And uh, well, then I will advance uh, to the next slide, uh, which is uh, the result, if you want to call it like this. So this is uh, the ZBW Journal Data Archive. It is now a productive, a productive service, and uh, it is a successor of the EDIVEX project. We uh, chose to build an application which is uh, based on Seekin. Uh, uh, it's an open source software that is often used by governmental open data portals and we customize it, uh, customized it to our needs. The metadata schema we chose is uh, the schema of the DOI registration agency for social and economic data in Germany called DERA. And uh, DERA is a uh, part of the DataSite consortium, but offers a much richer metadata schema, specifically for social and econo for social and economic data. That's the reason why we chose this uh, schema. And uh, well, um, I also would like to describe. Uh, the workflow of the data archive, just to keep it short, but nevertheless, you might uh, have heard of it then. So first, um, normally it works uh, in that way that an editorial office registers an author to the data archive. And then the system notifies the author about her account. Subsequently, she's asked to uh, start the submission of her application files and uh, providing some metadata. Um, well, and after doing so, the system notifies the editors about the data upload. Then the editors uh, uh, log into the system and uh, they do a little bit uh, this whole quality assurance. So they check whether the data is sufficient according to their data policy and uh, they also check parts of the metadata. And um, yeah. So the editors review the data and uh, they also provide some additional information on the article. So for instance, the DOI to the article, the issue of the pages, all these 
things. Last but not least, the data, as you can also see, uh, receives uh, DOI and gets publicly published. Okay, so I am. Well, uh, one last step in the project that I shortly want to mention is uh, the evaluation of the project results. So at the end of funding phase one, we invited uh, uh, the editors of economics journals to evaluate uh, uh, the results and also the pilot application that uh, we built at that time. And I can tell you this was a very helpful. We um, received uh, very valuable feedback uh, from, the, uh, from the community. And uh, this uh, was uh, really a lot. Uh, I can tell you uh, that the application looked uh, really quite different than it is now at that time. And uh, yeah. so uh, we implemented large parts of their feedback uh, in the second funding phase. Okay, it's up. Yes, and then uh, I think this is uh, already my last slide, so I'm quite fine with the time, I hope. So I think um, and the benefits of our approach, uh, let me just summarize uh, some important messages. Um, again, I want to emphasize uh, the importance of the analysis phase, where we had enough time to el evaluate uh, uh, the whole data and methodology in economics, and also we learned about the perceptions of economists towards data sharing. And uh, well, also the project opened many doors for us. Uh, for instance, our uh, contacts towards learned societies have massively increased since uh, that point in time. And uh, also regarding the almost 30 research data centers in Germany, we made good connections with them and uh, also some cooperation that uh, lasts uh, till today. So it's uh, EDEVEX in. Uh, has been in a few parts at least uh, some kind of a nucleus for further projects in research data management. For instance, uh, there's a journal called IRI, an internet only journal for applications in empirical economics. And uh, this uh, also already some of the editors are part uh, of IRI. And uh, well, this is very good. Yeah. And uh, I uh, want to also add that the project helped to transform the per perception of the library from an institution that deals with books and papers and all these old-fashioned things uh, towards a much more modern research uh, infrastructure provider. Yes, and that's it. Uh, so thank you very much for your time and your attention and well, questions after all the presentations. Thanks. Thank you so much, Sven. That was really interesting. And I like what you said about how it transformed the perception of, of your library in the eyes of the research community. <laughs> I jotted that one down. Um, OK, so moving on. And again, as I said before, we'll, we'll save the questions to the end of all six presentations. Our next presenter is Barbara Hirschman from ETH Zurich. And she's going to talk about um, the research data management services they've developed at at her organization. So welcome, Barbara. I think you might still be on mute, Barbara. Mute myself. Yes, can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, and can you see my screen? You can see your desktop. Desktop, okay. Let's see. Can you see the slides now? Yes. Um, are they in the presentation mode? No. Okay, sorry. No problem. <laughs> I have to somehow change the... Let's see. Mm. Don't know how to do that. You could just leave them. They don't need yeah, to. Yeah, I, I would just leave them here. Because yeah. I have some problems with the second screen. Too, so I will just it's do it like fine. that, huh? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. Um, so um, 
at ETH Zurich. We have also um, developed some services around research data management, but I will today focus on one particular, which is the um, repository. And um, um, just for some context, ETH Zurich is the Swiss National um, Institute for um, Science and Technology, and um, it's one of the world leading universities in the fields of technology and natural sciences. And um, I work in the ETH library, um, which is the main library of um, the university, but it's also a Swiss national center for technical and scientific um, information. And at the library, um, we are running uh, this repository that we call Research Collection, and it has been launched um, approximately um, one and a half years ago. And um, it's, um, it's a repository that for the university um, fulfills three functionalities, actually. It's used as an as a, a institutional bibliography, so it records all the publications that are produced at the university. It's also um, an open access repository, um, but we also use it as a research data repository. And um, the project that led to the launch of this um, repository um, was actually a quite big project for us. Um, it took us from uh, 2014 to 2017 to have this um, implemented because it was um, um, also a migration project. We, we uh, merged two existing databases um, into the new repository. And uh, it also involved a public um, tender process. So um, we actually looked for a service provider to help us with the development of this um, um, publication platform. And so this involved some um, quite long phase of um, requirements analysis and evaluation. And um, finally, um, the award of contract was given to a um, um, service provider from Belgium who um, offered to uh, make these um, developments on the basis of DSpace, which probably most of you know, um, which is a repository software that's um, mainly focused on publications. So what I want to um, show you today is um, how we implemented the requirements that were specifically um, focused on research data into this um, repository that uh, we developed and, um, during this project. Um, the, um, this repository that we're running, it's a highly integrated system within the university information infrastructure. Um, this is one of the main complexity factors of um, having developed the repository and running it. Um, we, are, we are reusing data from other ETH systems, such as from a person directory or from the grants management system, but we're also pushing the, the publication data to other um, systems such as the annual academic um, reporting or the web CMS and all these interfaces need to be uh, managed and up to date which is um, quite quite some um, work to do. Um, when it comes to research data we, we did in the beginning of the project like uh, something like a gap analysis we looked at the repository that we had before, which was only for publications, and we identified the main features that we wanted to implement in a new repository um, that are maybe not the same for publications and research data, but that are somehow um, an addition or new features that we want to implement because for, for being able to host research data in the repository. And this slide is just a summary. I will, I will go through each of these um, topics now. Um, individually. Um, first of all, um, the way we, we included the research data between the repository is we simply um, made up, opened the new publication type um, that we called research data and then we have some subtypes that basically were inspired by the um, research, research types within the data side metadata schema and um, this has uh, worked out fine for us, so most users are happy with the, with the um, types of research data that they can deposit in the repository. Um, for being able to record the metadata, um, we extended um, the metadata schema from one of the legacy systems with some additional fields. 
Again, these additions were also basically drawn from the data set metadata schema, which um, provides some basic fields for, um, for research data such as geolocation, for example, that we did not have before in the metadata schema when it was only used to describe publications. And um, then uh, we, we used the internal metadata format of these page so it's already there. And then we um, integrated the mappings so that we are able to um, publish the data in some standardized, out, standardized, out, standardized output format, sorry. Um, um, such as, again, data set metadata schema, so we can really describe the research data as well as the publications with these um, formats. Um, when it comes to the access rights, we also implemented um, some um, new features um, for depositing the, the research data. Um, so basically, it's not only possible to, to um, publish data with, uh, for free access in the repository, but users are also able to um, um, deposit the data only for archiving purposes or also, for example, only for access for other users from within the university. So there is a more um, um, uh, there are more op access rights options available for research data than for publications because we wanted to keep the repository in, in the sense of an open access repository for publications, but we also recognize that for research data we need more um, uh, a more developed access rights level concept. Um, then the other um, requirement that we saw is regarding the, the file formats. Um, we want to have a repository that can host um, all file formats, um, but then we also give the user uh, um, some information when they upload their data on whether um, the file format that they have uploaded is actually um, suitable for long-term archiving. So for this, we use uh, the so-called BitFit stream format registry within this space, which can give the user very basic information about the support level of the file, of the, um, file formats. But um, it's also true that this space does not really have a real format detection or validation um, integrated, which might be a problem um, if you use it also as a preservation system, but we don't really do that. We have a separate um, digital preservation infrastructure, um, which can um, fulfill these requirements regarding um, format validation and preservation. Um, the other thing that we implemented for research data is um, the concept of retention periods. Um, we give the uh, submitters the possibility to choose um, to, to decide themselves um, um, the retention period for their data. And we also recommend that they only um, choose an, an indefinite um, retention period if they are actually able to upload their files in formats that are suitable for long-term archiving. So we try to explain to them that it doesn't really make sense to upload data in uh, formats that are not suitable for long-term archiving for an unlimited um, time period. And um, uh, therefore, we also provide the option of um, having the um, data only stored for 10 or 15 years. But um, also, um, currently, this is not an automatic process. It's just uh, information that we record in the metadata. And it gives, basically gives the ETH library the possibility to delete um, files in the future if we decide to, um, to do so. And here are um, some features that we implemented in the user interface. So, um, we give the users the possibility to preview the content of um, zip and tar containers if the data is uploaded in such um, container formats so that they don't have to download the whole data package um, um, in advance uh, or they can look into what's the content of the data package before downloading. Um, then we have implemented a field for um, displaying um, and recording the relations between data sets and publications or also um, between one data set and another data set. So these items can be linked uh, within the repository. Um, when it comes to the download statistics, we, we are using uh, this um, statistics within uh, DSpace that are displayed. 
and we can also um, display the arithmetic uh, information if, um, for example, the data set was mentioned on Twitter, so then the user can click through to this information. Um, so to sum up, um, maybe um, some lessons that we have learned during this project. Um, in our project, um, since this was not only a project to develop a research data repository, but also a publication database, um, the research data features were not really the uh, most complicated to implement. We had a lot of more work to do with all the interfaces that, that um, we, are, we were developing. So I think that um, it's, it's really a feasible effort to um, use this space as a research data repository. But we also had a big advantage at the ETH library that we already have a separate technical um, infrastructure for digital preservation. So we also are running an instance of um, the Rosetta digital preservation system. And this fact helped us um, to focus in the repository project more on usability um, features and end user related requirements during the publication process because um, all the preservation tasks are managed in a, a separate um, system. Um, and now, um, since we are running the repository now for more than um, a year, I can also uh, mention some things that we have noticed on about how the user actually, users are actually using the system. Um, so this is probably not new to most of you. Um, we could have added a lot more metadata fields, but um, the main um, learning is that users would not use them. So they usually only supply the required minimum um, of metadata. Um, what the users really um, like is the possibility to link the data sets to the um, related publications. And we also have a workflow for previewing URIs or reserving URIs, and this, this is also used a lot. Um, the, um, the access restrictions that we've implemented are not used so much as we had thought. Uh, actually, most uh, data sets that are um, deposited in the repository are freely available. And then we have um, a lot of users that are asking us for the possibility to deposit larger files. We can, cannot currently um, offer this. Um, we have set a limit of 10 gigabyte per file, which is actually already quite a lot for an online repository. But um, at ETH, we um, have a lot of users that produce, produce much larger data sets and they are looking for um, technical solutions to publish those and uh, these are really not existing already right now. Um, so this is one thing that we are working on. We are looking into solutions for storing and publishing larger files than what we can currently do. And another project that we are currently starting is um, developing an integration with uh, OpenBIS, which is an open source tool for active data management that was also developed at ETH Zurich. And then for the future, we have already some other, some more ideas, like we would like to get the repository um, certified with a core trust seal certification. We would like to improve the way we can um, record um, geolocations in the metadata and also implement um, schema.org metadata for um, getting the repository indexed in Google dataset search. Okay, thank you. I hope I did not take too much time. <laughs> Thank you very much, Barbara. That was really interesting. And I'm sure there'll be questions afterwards. Um, so uh, uh, let's keep moving on. Our, we move now from the Anglo-Saxon world to the Latin world. <laughs> um, and our next presenters are Louise Anglada and Marie Alcala from the, um, cons the Consortia of University Libraries in Catalonia. So please go ahead. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. See? Okay. Good afternoon. Thanks for the invitation and the opportunity to explain that we are doing in the research data management. Uh, well, our title, we are using the title that is the title of the webinar, but that the, this is the title that we, the, the, the general idea that we have, because uh, we start, well, the group of the people that we work with, we start to work together 
for a long time ago uh, working in open access and now we are still working on open access but we we move all, all the group into the open data first of all to to uh, an explanation about our context we are not uh, university we are a consortium we was born in the mid 90s uh, with the objective to to create a union catalog but we traditionally we did uh, a lot of licensing and the traditional uh, library services but we decided in 2013 we thought that a new kind of needs uh, are appearing in for libraries is the services for the researchers and we created a, a working group for the the, of people from the different universities in order to share the, our activities that we are doing uh, supporting uh, research activities in general. These men that we work at in this group in, and we still are in open access activities but also we, we, we promote the use of the ORCID but also we are promoting uh, the usage of the Mendeley for the bibliographic uh, uh, references uh, and, and on. Finally, we could to create in 2017 uh, 17, um, an area. We are a big consortium in this moment. We are not only working in the li for the for libraries, but we work for universities in general. For instance, uh, with a lot of it's, it's difficult to have a comparison because we are not only doing uh, technological activities or services like DANS or the GISC is doing the equivalent uh, because we are also buying things together, for instance, uh, electricity. Uh, this big consortium is divided in, in areas and my area is the open access where we that we I think it was our objective is not only to have te technician working in preparing reports or advices, but also that we wanted to have, is that we have here, that we wanted to have is a direct access to the vice rectors of research. I don't know in other countries, but in Spain now, the, the all that we can call open science is an issue not well established, but who the people that who can to understand and manage and to take decisions are the vice president of the research. The vice president of research are very busy persons, and it's in the in the normal structure is difficult to talk with. And with the, one of the most useful things that we did is to create these 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 kind of meetings. We met the vice rectors only two two times in a year or even less, but almost that we try, try is to to put them together, not to divide. Uh, th those meetings are not meetings where the research, the universities uh, bargain uh, for the money that they, they, they want to receive from the government, but they are meetings talking about uh, open data, open access, open metadata, because we have a portal uh, with the um, information of all the research outputs of our researchers and things so. This is the two commissions, technical commissions that we have, the technical commission for this portal for the research. This portal is kind, is, is quite similar like uh, NARCIS, for instance, and other portals that are in this moment are uh, existing at the European level. Uh, we, we, when we talk about the open access, we say the open access is sure open data, sure open access, but also it's open metadata. Open metadata means that the outputs, uh, you know that the outputs of the research are in the crease of the universities, but the, those data are not always uh, open. So that we are doing with this portal is to put all this data open. Well, we've been working in, in about the research data but uh, in this more general context and we've been working since the 2016 uh, that is when, in cooperation with Robin that you you've been working since the 2010 is 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 quite recent but for us is 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 long time ago because we try it almost to work very seriously offering 
data services uh, to our uh, uh, to our researchers. I say that after I will explain which kind of uh, services are we providing. But after the, uh, uh, at the beginning, that we want is to explain wh wh which is our vision uh, today. When we began in 2016, we thought we thought that the, the, to have a repository for data was uh, uh, a need, an imperious need. In this moment and after two years working on that and uh, after some surveys that we we did, um, our opinion is that there is a very big gap, an, an enormous gap between that uh, the researchers perceive as a need and uh, the people that we are focusing for the open data, we say that is a need. So the, the gap is enormous. Uh, Mireia has the figures, but and we will share uh, when we finish uh, to process our survey. But we have the number of the people with uh, European projects, but the, and at the same time, the number of the people that contacted some of the research support services in university, and the difference is, is very, very big. So, uh, adding to that, uh, to, to, to the gap between the, the, the need. Uh, uh, the, the perceived need for us and the, for researchers, also that we, with our short or long, I don't know, but experience is that uh, we try to, to apply the same that we learn for open access to open data, but open data are really, really very different of the open access. An article in, in, in mathematics is quite, is, is practically, formally, is the same that an article in philo philology or philosophy, it doesn't matter. But when you compare the data, the, this, is, this is not true. The, the data are complex, are strange, are diverse, it depends, a very discipline depending. So for all the reasons, we perhaps change it a bit, our approach, and we don't have a unique approach, and we have this asymmetric approach to the, to the research data. And here, there is the six uh, lines that we are, we are following. The green ones are the things that we are doing. The, re the red is the Hi, thing. Louise, sorry, can I just interrupt? Because we're not seeing your slides move. Can you see? Uh, um, no, uh, no, I don't know, think about it. Uh. Mm. And now? We're still just on your first slide. On your first slide? To move? Yeah. Okay. Please. Uh, no. Mireya, uh, ability, uh, the addition ability. You have the window with the addition yeah, ability. Yeah. You, your screen is sharing. We see and your screen. Oh. As we see your screen. Okay. Um, okay. Now we don't see your screen. And share. And this is the second slide. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now we can see your second slide. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. I should have uh, told you earlier. I wasn't sure whether you were going through your slides. Uh, third the slide. Yes, we can see your third slide now. Okay, okay. So in this slide here, we have six, six act, uh, lines of action. The green ones, I will explain more in detail, everyone, but the greens are the things that we are already done. The red is the things that we are working uh, in this moment, and the blue is one thing that for the moment we are not working uh, to implement. The the, the first that we are doing is, is, is because we think here is, is, is a graphic where we are explaining that there are some data that some data is very, very, very big, very big, but only few people are working with very, very big data. But a lot of people are working more in, 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 in the long tail of data. Um, in, in, in Europe, they are using more or less the same concept, but here is organized by disciplines, and probably this, is, this coincides. 
Probably here there are genetics, astrophysics, and here other things. But we as a, as a consortium based in, in, in one uh, uh, region that we think is that we need this to, to solve the problems that our research uh, has and to do that, that we need this to make or differentiate between very, very complex problems with the data management and publication that can be here and problems that can be more easy to solve. We think that for all, for all, all the researchers will need a, a research data management plan. And this is that we began uh, doing. And we, we did, like our colleagues in, in, in the consortium Madroño Madrid, Madrid and, and, and you and other colleagues in Europe, that we, is, uh, we are using uh, the online tool that is based in the DDC. DDC. But the important, I, I, I don't want to minimize the importance of to using an already existing tool, but uh, that, uh, in my opinion, is important that we are doing is that we are cooperatively, uh, we, we are sharing how to inform, to put examples, to clarify, to disseminate. So this can be done clearly at the university level, but we are doing this in a group of uh, 12 universities. So we are sharing the information, but also we are improving the information through that we are uh, uh, we, we are sharing all the improvements that we we are creating in the in for the uh, data management plans and this I repeat this is for all the second group or the second line of actions is that we uh, consider that uh, in a small group of people but uh, that is 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 a group very big from the data or the the volume of data is already solved for the disciplinary uh, repositories. Perhaps we cannot exactly agree which, uh, which disciplines has a very uh, a well-defined disciplinary repositories, but um, and also it's true that we cannot to say at that moment that all the disciplines has a well-established data repository, but some ones, yes. So the first thing that we, our group, not, not the first, the second thing after the, the, the data management plan, the second thing that we did is to identify in which cases uh, already exist a disciplinary repository very well established. And if it is the case, if someone asks us for advice, and if this uh, person belongs to one of these disciplines, we clearly will say, your deposit, your repository where to publish your data, your, our advice is, is, is go to the disciplinary repository. We maintain a list of recommendations of disciplinary, but also general data, but uh, this is a characteristic, a set of, of uh, with all the, uh, repositories that we accept and recommend as disciplinary. The third thing that we are doing, that we, we think that it can cover this kind of, of some kind of, of, of data, is that we are improving the already existing institutional repositories. Uh, my personal opinion, I say my because not all my colleagues agree is that, is that the actual uh, institutional repositories uh, on, can only be a transitory tools to publish um, repository data. Even uh, it's, it, it's good to adapt the institutional repositories to, to to put, uh, we, in general, we are using the space, and as our colleague in Zurich uh, mentioned it, the DSpace accept all kind of files, so you can to put the files there. But the problem is not only to put the files there, but also to maintain the data in a fair mode. And we need to know exactly uh, what what fairs means or what uh, fair. Um, or what kind of fair repository of data we need to, to offer. This is a very pragmatic approach, but in my opinion, uh, is, 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 it has no, not a clear future. We need to clearly improve 
the facilities that we are offering now in the institutional repositories, if we want to have a, a safe and a fair, in general, a fair repository data. The fourth thing that we try to do, uh, I think is a, is a good idea, but it's a good idea not accepted for our bosses, eh? is that we said, okay, this is true, this is a problem to, to the management of data is, is, is a challenge for a lot, a lot of people, but some ones are really involved in the, man, in the, in the data management probably all the researchers, but someone that clearly has a lot of experience. In every university, we, we, are, it's, we are sure that there are uh, research groups that they are uh, using research data since a long time. So why not to put them together and to give them uh, good resources and to create a group, a working group a pilot working group that identifies the issues and to work and to build uh, knowledge to share for others. The idea was to create that between different universities and to, to support this with not only with software but also with data curator. But the idea uh, has not been accepted for the cost and probably also for organization, organizational reasons. The five actions that we are doing at 3D is that is where we are because it's the most new, the other are uh, uh, running since some months almost. Is uh, after uh, we, we met with the vice president of research, we explained that is happening with the data. They are quite reluctant because they, the, the, there is a lot of uh, things not very well solve or clarify it here, the, uh, it's similar that we need to, or it, it, it's good to have solution in order to publish data in, in, in our, uh, in, in Catalonia or in our local region. But at, for the moment they said, okay, that we need is to share the diagnosis, what, what, what it's necessary in order to have, um, a repository of data that can to be accepted and a uh, feasible repository for, for where to publish data. No? Here the intention I repeat and I show again our, uh, this is that we are not pretend no, to cover the needs for someone that we, uh, we clearly, uh, we are not looking to solve the, 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 the publication, uh, the, the data publication needs of the genetist of astrophysics. That we, that our objective is quite modest. The, our objective is, is, is to be able to solve the, the, the publication research data for the 70, 80 perhaps uh, researchers in, in, in our university or research system. And this is where we are focusing. But at the same time, I think that we have, well, that we want to do one repository, this is not decided, one or more, this is doesn't matter, but the, that we need to know is exactly which are the conditions, the specific, sorry for the, for the to be so pragmatic, but uh, it's nice to, to, to listen and to read about the fair data, but uh, there are a lot of not, no, no, not a specific. Uh, there, there are a lot of philosophy and not uh, very, uh, and, and not a lot of uh, specific uh, recommendations. And that now, that just now, what we are doing is to, we are collecting the the characteristics that has to have a, a fair repository, but characteristics feasible. Uh, perhaps is is it, it seems obvious, but this is not. For instance. It's obvious for all uh, uh, these audience that a DOI is necessary, but uh, when you ask about the, or you suggest the creation of a DOI service for the Catalan universities, th this can be not accepted for the cost or for different things. So that we try is to define very well that is uh, the characteristics that has, has to have uh, the, the repository, yeah, or for instance, uh, the preservation, one characteristic, if you, we want to reuse the, the, the data in, in, in four years, we need to have the data safe 
for during all this time. You need to preserve the data. Preservation needs, for instance, to have copies in different places. So we need to be that we want is to be very specific, very practical to say, well, the characteristics that this kind of repository has to have is this one. And after to analyze that the cost that can can get the, the cost of this 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 repository if we decide finally to do it doesn't matter if we decide to do it for all catalonia or if we decide to do every, in every university at this at the same time uh, the the last thing that we are talking but not doing we are doing anything here is to separate the publication needs for the management needs. I don't know in your universities, but here one of the stakeholders for this kind of issues are the, 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 the IT staff. For the IT staff, they are, when you, you talk about the data, they are not distinguishing between a final data or the raw data. They are talking about data. They talk about only about the, the, the petabytes and terabytes. And you say, well, the needs for the, to manage information, to manage data is one kind of need. This is a need. But the, the need to publish the data is another kind of need. This is not exactly the same. Here, to manage data, you need a lot, big, big, big storage for the data. But, but when you are in the publication of data that you need is, uh, is, is that those data can be very uh, safe and very secure and you get to reuse in the, in the future. Yeah. So those are, are our approach. Our approach that's, as you can, could see is, is, is a, six, a six, we have six lines of approach and the, 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 in this moment, the, the big challenge is how we reach to communicate or to contact or to, uh, to the researchers and how the researchers can begin to, to trust us and to, to work together in order to, to, to publish and to manage better the research data. Many thanks. Thank you so much, Louise. And, and, uh, and I, I think I, I agree with you about the very high bar that the FAIR requirements um, put to us. And I'm really looking forward to, um, once you have some kind of feasible uh, recommendations around how to be FAIR, if you could share that with us, I think that'd be really interesting. Um, so I'm just cognizant that we're running out of time. We've got about 20 minutes left. So I will quickly introduce our next speakers, Rebecca Marin and Marisa Perez from Modronio Consorcio. And then we have one more um, uh, presenter after that. So um, Rebecca and Marisa, if you could try to keep your presentation to 10 minutes, that would be great. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Oops. Hello, uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much uh, for letting us to, uh, to participate in this webinar. Rebecca and I are members of the Consortio Madroño. Oh, sorry, I think, oh, excuse me. Yeah, look, no? We still don't see your slide. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. Oh, no, what is it? Okay. It's in the bottom, share yeah, screen. Yeah. Let me have a look. Come back. Oh, great. That okay? Okay. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, guess I will start again. Rebecca and I are members of the Consortium Madroño Research Data Working Group. But what is the Consortium Madroño? Uh, the, is the consortium of universities of the community of Madrid and the UNED library for cooperation and has its fundamental objective to increase in the scientific production of its universities, improving the quality of library services and promoting cooperation plans among its members. Here you can see the, the logo of the six uh, universities involved in the consortium. And what I have to say first is that the, the Consortium Madroño supports open science to front open access to publications 
to um, uh, open access to, to data. And it was just last year, the 5th of December 2017, when all the universities signed uh, an, open, an open science declaration uh, on open access to publications and open to data. The, the full test is available on the, our web page. Uh, I have, I'm going to use, and um, well, Rebecca and me have decided to use these posters, who, which was designed with, uh, by one of our colleagues, Belen, and it was presented at the last year annual meeting in Venice. Uh, here you can see that the, the services we offer to all our researchers. And first of all, it's Investiga, Investigaeme, which is the research portal with, uh, run by the Consortium Madroño which tries to support uh, all the research activities of our university members uh, for on open access to publications and to open access to data. There are three main tools on that page. Uh, first of all, it's ISA e Ciencia, uh, which was launched the, on 27, and it's a service provider, which a provider, sorry, uh, which harvests uh, metadata for uh, different institutional repositories of the region of Madrid. Later on, uh, with the European Union framework and the H2020 and the open access to research data pilot, uh, we, start, we decided that it was the moment for starting to work on data. And that's why uh, in on sorry, on 2014, uh, we developed Pagoda. Pagoda is a page where you can have uh, documents and information about uh, how to research, about uh, research data management. And uh, due to the fact that uh, the open access uh, research data pilot and uh, the projects which got uh, financial help from, from that have to uh, present a data management plan, uh, they are we have also a, an, a tool, PGD Online, uh, who, uh, which help our researchers to develop this data management plan. Uh, PGD Online is a translation of uh, DMP Online, the Digital Curation Center, uh, who was the one who developed this uh, tool. And we were at that time in collaboration and comparison with them and we did the translation. Uh, so now this tool is available in Spanish for uh, all the researchers in the world, especially if they are interested in Spanish matters. And uh, the only thing that is that the requirements uh, are only available for, for Horizon 2020. In the future, if any other funder uh, applies for, suggests that the, the researchers should uh, make another kind of data management plan, uh, they would be added this template. And in the last one, I have to talk about eCiencia Datos. Ciencia Datos is our research data repository. As I said before, the starting point it was Horizon 2020, and the uh, open the research uh, open um, data project pilot, and then the need of this data management plan. But how to propose a research data services at our universities? Our initial reflections were: Is data sharing reflected in our policies? Uh, the answer it was no. Is our repository prepared to receive data? Well, perhaps some kind of data, yes, but not all of kind of data. Which was the priority? Uh, can we work with individual repositories in the same way as we did with Eciencia? Or shall we prepare and, and consult your repository for all the universities which are member? We opt for this last uh, um, op option. Uh, fourth question is, is my research community ready? And uh, the answer is, I think it's not. Uh, is the library staff prepared? Well, at the beginning, uh, not. Now I, I, I think, I hope that it's more involved and at least they have some knowledge about research data. Do we collaborate with other university services such as IT services or research office? The answer is yes, of course especially since most of the universities have their own CRIS. 
here, we can have a look to the timeline we have, time, we have done. It was on 2015 when we started thinking about research data and when we choose the, the software we were going to use. It was Dataverse from the Harvard Dataverse uh, project. It was in January uh, 2016 when the alpha version was installed. And at the end of that year, we, we organized uh, a workshop to do some training for on research data management uh, to all the library staff from the, all the libraries of the consortium. It was on January 2017 when we had this beta version. Uh, it was able to have done assignment to all the data sets we produced, and it was an adaptation to Spanish. At December uh, last year, we can say that uh, our repository, our data repository, it was open air compliant as well uh, um, reliable from most of the scientific editors. They told us that they were not going to use our name, but uh, if our researchers were, wanted to use our repository, they were completely our it. And uh, on, since April this year, uh, our version is completely stable. I have to add that on May, uh, no, on June, sorry, this year, uh, from that date, we are members of the Global Dataverse Community Consortium. And also we are members of the data site, uh, we are data site clients. I don't know if for how long, because being a member of the uh, Dataverse community, we get a better price for getting those. So perhaps we change our mind in the future, I'm not sure. Uh, which are the technical requirements for our data repository? We choose at last between SICAN and Dataverse. Uh, as our technical staff uh, were more confident with Dataverse, we opt uh, to use Dataverse. The Ciencias Datas and Datos is now based on Dataverse version 493 with some adaptations. The server is located in the Madroño Office Junet uh, Central Library and all the technical requirements you can see over there. Uh, there are at least one backup per month, but depends on the number of the data sets that are uploaded uh, during that period. Um, we thought that it was necessary to, to do some training and we started uh, with the group, with members of our group and we did some self-training and then we, we followed doing some training for all the library's staff and now we are in the phase of preparing and organizing training for our researchers and our research offices. So which are the, the, the services we are offering at the moment? Uh, we have our research and data uh, repository uh, with delegate archive. Uh, we um, demand our uh, researchers to use open and final data, um, even when sometimes we have set some embargo and some proprietary systems due to the fact that there are some scientific communities that use proprietary uh, software. And we also recommend our uh, researchers to, to, to use or to upload with the data sets a readme me file with information uh, about the data, such as title description, methodology, funding, time, usage rights, etc., etc., which make our data, data sets comprehensive and reusable. Uh, we accept all kinds of uh, formats and at the same time there is no limit on the um, size of the files we are going to use. And there is a DOI assignment for each of the data sets and uh, well we have a deposit license and also a usage license. Uh, we suggest uh, mainly uh, to our researchers to use the Creative Commons uh, the public domain license, but if they prefer to use any other, they are well accepted. They just need to contact the research uh, managers of the repository and it will be uh, uploaded that information. And uh, we also use a um, data site uh, metadata schema, uh, which makes some adaptations so uh, to be able to be open air compliant. Um, here you can see some of the infography we have prepared for the Open Access Week this year. And so we'd like to have our data to be fair, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. That's why we have metadata, user license, DOI, 
and these readme files. Uh, our uh, data sets uh, uh, release the requirements of Horizon 2020, if they are uh, fund receive funding from them, are compatible with the data publications policies of main publishers, and you can search them in Google Dataset Search or in the Dataverse uh, Harvard Network. We are also promoting the, the repository, the data repository via blog and Twitter. And as I said before, we have prepared this infographic about the, our services in both Spanish and in English. And also uh, we have created, um, which is uh, now available on YouTube, a video to promote all these uh, all these uh, tools and also uh, the open size between our researchers and the public in general. As conclusion, we have said that even if it has taken us uh, some time, we, we were able to launch the consortium data repository, I think in a record time, because it has taken us a, a year. Uh, we try to involve our uh, colleagues at the libraries, we try to involve the researchers of the universities. It's not very easy, and that's the truth. Now we have only 286 data sets. Uh, we have introduced the geolocation for our data sets, and we have now three uh, digital humanities projects. As you can see here, they are more connected with the social science uh, uh, projects. Here you can see a uh, different image taken from our repository and I think, uh, I think this is enough for to today and uh, if you want uh, to ask us any questions, we will be happy to, to answer them. Thank you so much, Marisa, and my apologies for making you rush through your presentation. <laughs> Um, and, and so, uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our final speaker, um, Jose Galeano, and he's from the University of Rosario in Colombia. And um, welcome, Jose, and thank you for um, staying with us so long. And we'll see if there's some people left at the end for questions, but for the moment, I'll turn it over to Jose. Okay, hello, everyone. Uh, I am Jose Galeano from Universidad de Rosario in Bogota, Colombia. I work for the area of the Resource Center for Learning and Research. And I would like to first start with a brief uh, history on our work with open access. We started in 2007, we were the first project in Colombia to conform a network of repositories and, access and give access to more than 100,000 publications. We have also been working with projects sponsored by the BID and the Net Clara Network. Uh, we also, in 2016, we started working on our draft uh, for open access, our institutional draft. In 2007, it was published. And in 2007, we were able to make an addition to the Berlin Declaration, being the first in Colombia to, to be able to, to, to do this. Uh, when we started working on the, on the project of research data management, we started with three pathways. The policy, the repository, and the services. The policy were going to be those. The, <clears throat> the policy that was going to support this project. The repository is more technical as in where will be stored the data and what were the standards and the uses of this, of this repository and the services that were, we were going to be able to provide to our users. We started to make a diagnosis phase, which consists of a benchmarking. Uh, we also did a trivia with our European year. What we did, we engaged researchers uh, through this trivia so they could feel as a pioneer and give them the, and kind of have their work and their the experience working with data. We also made a survey interview and focus group. From this, from this diagnosis, we were able to, to answer some questions that we had, such as where the people store the data, where the researchers store the data, uh, we found out that most of them store it in the computer or in a USB drive or external uh, dr uh, drives. We were also determined the size of the data that they were working. This helps us to kind of think forward on the technical side and how big our, our server uh, needed to be. Also the duration that they kept the, the, the data for. This ranges from five to 10 years and most importantly, who the data belong to. And the researchers, they told us that 
Most of the data belong either to the research, to the author of the article, or to the people that collect the data. <clears throat> Through the diagnosis, we were able to have some challenges. Is First of all, I'm gonna talk about the ethical and legal, legal challenges. In Colombia in 2012, there was a law that gives empowerment to the people about their personal data. So this kind of sensitizes the people about their data and how they have certain, certain ownership of that data and how they can either opt in or opt out on, on certain services and studies. Also, we had some, the issue of property. Uh, some of the research group uh, work with another research group of another area or maybe if it's funded, the data belongs to them. So we kind of uh, had to figure that out and how we were gonna be able to, to work with that. And also the share of the data using the appropriate licenses. We wanted to, uh, to provide, and we want to provide the, the right uh, license that the researchers need. And, and this is kind of the services that we're gonna work on uh, to kind of accompany them with this, with this subject. Also, we have some technical uh, challenges. Of course, prevent the loss of research data, which was the mainly focused uh, concern that the researchers had. And they were scared of the loss or the leak or maybe the hack of the, of the research data. Also, we had how to restrict access to the data on certain phases of the project if it was uh, necessary and the ability of the data over time and its versioning. We also uh, came out with the sensitization that we needed to work on and give the uh, researchers the, the awareness of the management of the research data. Like I said, most of them uh, kept their data on the computer on the, on the drive and this, this imposes major risks for the institution and the researcher. And also provide users the confidence of the results by providing them the inputs and the outputs generated by the by the, by the research, and so we can also uh, avoid cases of deliberate misconduct. So from these mobilities that we had uh, with the Universidad uh, of Mino and the diagnostic results, the position and the experience that we have with open access and the repositories, we were able to determine certain uh, items that the policy would have. And of course, the first was to the intellectual, to have the aspects of intellectual property of our research data. Um, we also create a mandatory procedure for research groups that are applying for funds to have a data management plan. And also the consents, we require the consents of, of the persons involved in the research to have a digital, digital store. With the repository, we were facing with some several uh, formats that we needed to, to make sure we were able to handle. Text, numeric, multimedia, some software specific, and also such as database of biological samples. And we made a benchmarking, we also did analysis of tools, and uh, this semester we were able to install Dataverse. We have it on the 4.9 version. We have a, a beta test right now going through. We're making some back and front changes, and we're hoping the next semester to have it published and be able to, to start publishing the, the research data. And as of services, uh, we have several services that we want to, to provide to, the, to our researchers. The first of all is give them an, an, a hand when they're making their the data management plans, also to adopt certain practices of open access and use of appropriate licenses. Uh, we're, we are a, a research uh, center also for students, so we want to also kind of broaden our, our, our users and give them the adoption of data citation practices to our students and to our researchers and, and teachers. And, and, allow, and give them a, the, the service of training on how to allow and maintain their data and how, they, if, on how these changes may, may, be, may be handled. Uh, I would like to first, I would like to end by presenting my team. Uh, this is the people that were working on this. Uh, right now we have, um, we have four persons and of course a lot of people are starting to raise their hands. A lot of researchers and research groups 
want to be involved with these projects or kind of uh, consider them. We're taking their inputs and we're taking uh, the experience that they have, so we can so we can uh, so we can have all these experiences and and having taken them into having taken them into account. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jose. And I, I, and that's really interesting that you say that a lot of researchers and, and research groups want to be involved with the project. Yes. So that's very exciting. It means you're responding to the real needs of the research. Yes. That's kind of an engagement um, strategy that we did when we did our trivia in our, in our focus group. We kind of want to give them certain empowerment and kind of uh, get them involved and aware of, of the situation and how this data management could really uh, put forward their, their work. Great. Um, well, uh, it's 1030 here where I am. So we've, we've gone for an hour and a half. Um, I'm wondering, can, can some of the panelists stay for a few questions? Um, if there are a few? From yes, the I yes, I can stay. Okay, great. Well, let's see if there are, I, I, some of the participants have already had to leave. Um, but are there any questions? And if you have any questions, could you just type them into the chat, please? And I'll read them out to the different panelists. And if your question is for a specific panelists, please identify who that is. I have a question, a general question for all, because, well, when we talk about the fair data, one of the, that it's clear is that we, one of the characteristics of fair is, is the, re, the, re, the, the, the ability to reuse the data. And to, re, to reuse the data, the first is to, is, is to be sure that the data will be here in four, five, or seven years. And in all the projects that I, you, the, I, I could not see that the preservation is a, is is an important uh, aspect of the the already installed projects. I don't know why. Yes, I I if I if I may answer first. Yes, we have a preservation. Uh, it's in our in our policy uh, strategy. Uh, like I said in the benchmarking and in the survey, we talk, we talked about this with our researchers. Uh, the ranges from of of this of of the storage of this data that they have they currently have ranges from five to ten years, some even more. So this is definitely a part of the policy. Uh, we want to make sure that the data is there for ten years. This is the most commonly and the and what researchers opt in more and what what it was kind of voted on. I may have not uh, mentioned it in, in, the, in the slides, but it's definitely part of the policy and it's an, it was an important aspect that was taken into account. Well, we, we are also um, working a lot on uh, digital preservation. Um, actually, yes, we have a separate infrastructure for digital preservation. We are exporting all research data items from DSpace also to Rosetta, which is uh, a system that is actually um, specialized in digital preservation, but also um, we need to take into account that preservation starts at the beginning and um, we need to educate our researchers about the file formats that are suitable for archiving. It doesn't help us if the researchers uh, give us their data in um, proprietary formats um, and tell us please keep it forever. This does not help anybody because um, we will not be able to migrate these formats um, in other formats in 10 or 15 years. So preservation is not only a technical problem, it's also an, a problem of, of educating the researchers and also we need to take into account that it doesn't make sense for every data um, to keep it forever. We need to uh, make clear to the researchers that they must think about which part of the data is really um, necessary to keep for longer time periods and which part of the data is maybe um, only um, relevant for um, publishing it now and maybe keeping a copy for 10 years or so about uh, not um, having the library um, look for it um, 
also in, in 20 years or so. Um, so this is definitely a huge topic um, to think about. Yeah, maybe from our perspective, uh, it's a little bit similar. So uh, we want to guarantee access uh, to the data uh, for 10 years, but uh, this is only the level of bitstream preservation, not uh, real digital long-term preservation. We also own the Rosetta system, but uh, our research data from uh, the publication-related data archive uh, is not part of Rosetta and will not be part of Rosetta. Instead, we are uh, working with a research data center because uh, we think that the research data centers are much more suitable in working with uh, this kind of data. They have much more experience uh, in handling with uh, these types of data than we have. And and therefore, we made a contract uh, with this uh, particular research data center. And uh, therefore, we expect that uh, the bitstream at least will be available for 10 years. Uh, of course, another question is whether data will be reusable for, uh, that, uh, for this time. Because we all know, uh, well, software, hardware are changing. And uh, from time to time, there are serious problems uh, with accessing uh, these old file formats. But uh, at least for well, a data archive for journals, uh, we think uh, this uh, is uh, sufficient at least. And uh, well, uh, when we're talking about uh, more services, uh, we also have uh, to think about some fees uh, for this data because currently this service uh, is completely free of charge for uh, these journals and uh, well when we are thinking about uh, long digital long-term preservation I think uh, this uh, needs to be changed but we don't want to change it. Yeah digital preservation is a real challenge um, especially for complex data formats uh, so there's a couple of questions in the text uh, chat. Um, one is for Louise and Murray, and it says, you stated in your presentation you seem to discourage use of existing repositories for data management. Are you suggesting that we have parallel systems, or which system would you recommend? And that's from Felix. And I think, Louise and Murray, you're, you're muted. Uh, well, no, we, we, we are using the institutional repositories, but uh, in my opinion is to use the repositories, the institutional repositories are good to start, but uh, they are not good for the future because the, the institute, the, the, the the institutional repositories that we already have in the universities, for instance, we are using, we, we are not using DOI, we, we are not preserving, uh, the, the data are not well preserved, the data has a lot of uh, limitations. So in order to start and to gain uh, practice uh, knowledge is good to, to, to use because it's a tool that you can to use today. No? You can to, to use today to publish the data. But I think that, uh, we need to have a clear idea that, uh, that, that the institutional repositories are not enough for if that we want is to have a service for the fair data. For the fair data, we need uh, some, some practice. For instance, we, have, we, we need to have a, a clear minimum set of metadata for data, for instance. We, have, we, need, we, need, we need to have uh, an exportation, a, a citation of data, uh, a set of metadata that we can to export in order to interoperate with the crease or with this kind of thing. So this, this, those are the, 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 new, the new issues, the new, the new services, the new features that the, the uh, a data repository has to supply. And in this moment, um, to use institutional repositories, it seems that is, is, is good enough. And in my opinion, is, is, is not good enough. We, 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 we need to be practiced, but also we need to be ambitious almost to, to establish a, a feasible uh, group of recommendations, but, but to establish th these kind of things. For instance, if for the preservation is necessary to have two copies, so we, 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 we need to say that it's necessary to have almost two copies in different places and to be very clear for that. Otherwise, uh, 
we 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 tend to 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 accept the reality as the reality is, and we need to modify the reality in order to improve the services that we are uh, actually do, uh, supplying with data. Yeah, it, it's really challenging, isn't it? Um, I think we conceptually we want to have the services some may perhaps located in the same location, but maybe using the same technology isn't the isn't the right choice. Um, uh, and so there's one more question here from Raman, um, and he's asking uh, Barbara at ETH. Which kind of format can Rosetta handle, and how does the bitstream preservation work? Okay, so I'm not a digital preservation specialist, but I can explain it on a high level. Um, you can ingest everything in Rosetta. Um, and then this is more a policy question. We have a list of um, our, our digital curation team um, maintains a list of file formats um, where there is a high possibility that they will be able to um, preserve them over the long term because um, um, these are open formats and they can probably be migrated to new formats in the future. And for these, um, we can offer these um, preservation measures that can be managed with Rosetta, but Rosetta itself does not um, do any migration um, tasks themselves. You have to have an archivist who is handling these whole um, preservation um, tasks. And uh, for the other file formats that uh, were these that are not on the list of recommended formats, we can simply only guarantee the, the, bit, the, the bitstream preservation, but uh, not that um, they will be uh, readable in the future. I don't know if that was clear enough. Thank you, Barbara. Um, and I just want to thank everyone again um, for bearing with us, because we went quite a bit beyond uh, the time that we had allotted for this, but uh, it's a testament to, I think, how complex research, managing research data is and, and also how important it is for our, our future services. So th thank you very much all of the presenters again and thanks to the participants who came to listen. And I think um, based on the conversation here, I hope that CORE is going to be able to tease out some kind of um, uh, key takeaways from the presentations and I will share with, with all of you and the, and the core community and I hope those kind of key takeaways will also be um, the, the framework or uh, uh, lay the groundwork for some future activities and maybe more targeted specific um, webinars around some of these ideas. So with that I wish you a good rest of the day and for those of you in Spain happy holiday tomorrow. <laughs> Thanks very much, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.